Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first ever episode of the IHSA podcast here on Prep Baseball Illinois. I'm Joe Sullivan, alongside everybody in the top voices and eyes of Prep Baseball Illinois, Drew Lacasio, Peter Hammett, and Diego Solares. Uh, for the first ever episode here and a lot to get into for the first few weeks of high school baseball in the state of Illinois. And we started off with the kickoff classic, which began on March 13th, where we saw some of the top prospects and the top teams in the state of Illinois battle it out and all across uh, the state in the southern part as well uh, as the Chicago area. We saw some of the top uh, guys from as far as arms uh, and bats. And we it all really started with Brady Bankston, uh, a big time performance, which he earned our pitcher of the week in the state of Illinois. And our very own Peter Hammond was able to see him throw uh, in, I believe, two appearances, Peter, where, you know, he got things started and, and got it going early on in the season. Yeah, I actually only saw the one performance, unfortunately, but it was the it was the beef of, you know, his the work that week. Um, and it was a fun one. I mean, he's been a guy that we've liked. I think the first time I ever saw him was uh, in Rantoul this past summer. Just a big, long right-hander, funky, deceptive delivery, low, like, sidearm almost release that just comes at you from a super weird angle. Um, then he showed really well again for us at the state game. So he's kind of been someone that's been trending up for us. Uh, still an uncommitted senior. But he was, I mean... It was about as dominant as you can get. He struck out the first nine of the game, uh, three pitches for strikes, uh, finished five innings with no hits, 11 strikeouts total, uh, just one walk, I think maybe one hit by pitch. But, I mean, it was a lot of the same as what we saw, you know, the first few times we saw him, the same deceptive delivery, 84 to 86, and it's got a lot of late, like, arm side action through the zone. He goes to – uh a uh, sweeping kind of lateral slider that he'll flip in there around like the low seventies. Um, and then he'll kind of just show that one, but he'll put guys away with the upper sixties curveball. But yeah, I mean, he was a fun one to watch, like calm collected on the mound. Doesn't really let anything get to him. Um, and then he finished the week. Let's see. What was it? Seven innings, uh, 14 strikeouts and just the one hit uh, and the one walk on the week. So Really good week for Brady. Really happy for that kid. Um, still an uncommitted senior, so hopefully he gets some love from that. And a lot to look forward for him, as well as normal community. He's starting off hot this season, 5-0 and on the year, and we'll talk a little bit about them later on uh, in the podcast. But then we move on from our pitcher of the week to the player of the week, and that's Jack Sweeney. A uh, big-time performance from him and, and got the bat off right this year so far, earning the Prep Baseball Illinois first player of the week of the IHSA, IHSA season. And Diego, able to go see him uh, where he got things rolling early. Yeah, Rochester came on down, picked up a pair of wins in the kickoff classic. Um, they're off to a 6-0 start. Jack Sweeney, big, physical, left-handed bat, hits in the two-hole for them. Uh, go to Northern Illinois, um, 6'3", 225, pretty hard to miss frame. Um, also a standout football player for the Rockets. Uh, Rochester's football team is actually kind of a perennial state champion powerhouse. Uh, they won state this past spring. He's a big time player on their defensive line. Um, earned our player of the week award. Like you said, man, he went seven for 16, four homers, a double, 10 RBIs, six runs scored. Um, actually homered again in their first game the next week. So he's up to five home runs on the year. Um, when I saw them, they beat Joliet West nine to eight. Uh, he hit two pull side homers at O'Fallon's field down the right field line. Uh, not cheapies either. One of them, I think, hit the, almost hit the Dairy Queen or at least got close to. Um, it's a physical left-handed swing, keeps his barrel in the zone. Perfect middle-of-the-order type bat that's joining the Huskies next year. Um, and also pitches for them. I think he threw six innings, a lot of one earned run. Um, he's their number one on the mound, A46, kind of from like a three-quarter arm angle. Tough look from the left side. He can spin a breaking ball for strikes. So he's off to a really hot start. Uh, definitely swings one of the more powerful left-handed bats in central Illinois. And um, he's kind of been the engine for Rochester this spring. 6-0 start. We'll, talk, we'll touch on them later. But big time showing from Jack Sweeney in week one. Yeah, and a lot of players across the state of Illinois getting the bats hot early. Uh, Owen Young, uh, quick shout out to him. He had two home runs and a double. Uh, on that Saturday game for him, as well as Adam Kozak, rounding it up and really a hot start 
for him in that 2026 class uh, as a sophomore. Uh, four, five, 50, 545 uh, on the year as long as well as a 687 on base percentage uh, through four games. Uh, he's grown a lot, obviously, and it's a big transformation from that freshman to sophomore year. And Drew, able to see him uh, and a few of those players kind of battling out uh, with two of those guys, almost weren't earning uh, player of the week. But again, getting those pads hot early for that 2026 class. Uh, and he's been great so far as a sophomore. Yeah. Um, so interesting about Adam, we didn't know who he was. Uh, we had never heard the name. At least I'll speak for myself. I had never heard the name. Um, comes out to the kickoff classic right away, you know, making a statement for our guy, Tyler Defaball, who was down there sitting on Lockport that day. Um, something Lockport typically does is it's a massive high school. There's always talent rolling through that school and they always have a couple guys that will pop up that we've never heard of. Um, I remember going and watching them at Lockport early in the year, two years ago, and their center fielder, Joey Monzo, uh, Monzo was a guy I'd never heard of, uh, led off, ended up being one of their top players, also played football for them. Um, Kozak seems to be kind of like the same next in line guy, um, undersized, but creates a lot of bat speed from what I saw in video was all over the barrel throughout the week, um, was in contention for player of the week and just looks to be a, a really good, you know, top of the order table setter for that, for that Porter squad this spring. Um, so, you know, for us, it's always great when a really good player comes out of the woodworks that we didn't know about, especially a sophomore, uh, that we can follow moving forward. And just looking at his stats that we put in our diamond notes last week, like he went six or seven with two triples, two doubles, five RBIs and five runs scored, um, with a walk and a stolen base. Uh, in their win over Mount Vernon, he went a perfect four for four with two triples, four RBIs and three runs scored. Um, also had a big day against normal West. So seems like he kind of does it all there for the Porters and they are off to a hot start. And, um, that to me is what the kickoff classic is all about is like seeing guys break out that we've never heard about. But what, what also makes the spring so great is that we get to go track down these teams, see guys that maybe didn't come to an event in the winter, um, but deserve recognition and deserve to be followed moving forward. So really happy for, you know, Adam and Lockport and um, excited to follow him moving forward. Yeah, I saw a lot of offense uh, in that kickoff classic, but also a lot of arms and a lot of really good arms uh, and a lot of arms that we actually were able to see over the summer uh, at the future games. And that was really, uh, you know, those guys come down from Southern Illinois uh, in the kickoff classic, which Diego, our, our expert on Southern Illinois uh, baseball, <laughs> Uh, for Prep Baseball Illinois, able to see uh, a lot of those guys that we were able to see over the summer kick off the high school season, uh, and they start out with a bang. Yeah, yeah. There are, uh, there is. If there's one thing that we're not short on down here in Southern Illinois, it's arms. Seems like every other week there's a guy that I've never heard of that pops up in his upper 80s that can spin a breaking ball. Um, so forgive me for rambling here, but kicking things off on Wednesday – kind of the start to the kickoff classic, Muscuda versus Mount Vernon. It was an early start, 4.30 game, uh, and two power arms going. Austin Musso, 2025, at Muscuda, Kansas commit, like you mentioned, Joe. He was a future gamer for us. Um, kind of the epitome of a guy that every time he takes the mound, the Indians got to feel pretty good about their chances of winning that ball game. Uh, gets it done every time we see him six foot two 195 pounds could definitely stack on 15 to 20 more pounds of muscle to his frame has increased and, and improved his movement patterns down the mound he's a really good mover stays connected uses the uses the rubber um up to 93 on the third pitch of the game fastball on the outer block on, on the outer half for a strikeout basically held 88 92 um, I don't usually say that high school guys have great command. It's like c command and control to me are two different things. Control is you're in the strike zone. Command is being able to put it wherever you want to. He commands his fastball um, on the corners at any point in time in any count to any hitter. Um, mostly fastball in this look, but slider was 76 to 79 with tight spin. Stays on that fastball plane and then breaks late. Um, and he'll spin a uh, kind of a get me over curveball with kind of a bigger hump to it at 67 to 71 miles per hour for strikes whenever. So three pitches in the zone often, a guy that 
has a reputation and a resume of dominating each time we see him. But opposing him, kind of going off what Drew said of guys we've never heard of, um, a freshman that is definitely a name to know for Mount Vernon is Trevor McClure, um, six foot one, 170 pound body. I'd heard some things about this kid kind of throughout the winter, some rumblings that, hey, there's a pretty big time arm coming from that part of the state that has produced several arms in the past. But I'll be honest, I didn't think it was going to be this good. Uh, young look, long limbs, played varsity basketball as a freshman for the Rams. Comes out, very first pitch of the game is 89 miles an hour. Super easy out the hand. He was 85-88 over two and a third innings. They kept him on a 45-50 to 50 pitch count because he's coming off basketball season. Really clean and easy out the hand, man. It's loose, loose on the backside, comes out real good. He, he's going to be a guy that is going to start throwing real hard once – he gets you know more comfortable with his body and and continues to add strength onto his frame. Um, and he was spinning a pretty good breaking ball with some sharp late spin and flash swing and miss upside at seventy four to seventy six miles per hour. The biggest thing with me for that was in two one counts in three one counts he would turn to it in, uh, to the middle of the Mosquito lineup because he knew that he couldn't just get a fastball by them, uh, which is pretty advanced confidence for a freshman to be doing that with his breaking ball in his first varsity start ever. So definite follow to know there. Um, kind of moving on, man, like Ethan Bagwell, a guy that has been on our radar for a really long time. He's a, a, a Mizzou signee, about as physical of a, of, a, of a human being as you'll find. Six foot four, 225 pounds, muscled up to the max. Um, had heard some reports over the winter that he was 95, 96 in bullpens. He comes out in the first inning against Oswego on Thursday, three o'clock start up to 97 in front of 15, 20, 25 professional scouts. First inning, he's 95, 96, touching 97, settling in at 92, 95. He was up to 95 in the third, 94 in the fourth. Um, Oswego had a handful of left-handed bats in their lineup. Four or five of the nine hitters were left-handed. So he was actually showing an 86 to 88 mile an hour changeup with hard run, something I have, I have not seen from him before, um, and feel for it too, like spawning it on the arm side corner. Uh, and then, you know, first time through the lineup, first three innings, he was mostly fastball changeup. That fourth inning started to throw his slider more. I think I counted seven or eight of them in the outing, 88 or 80 to 81 with some downhill tilt to it. That's a pitch that to me personally has, has shown swing and miss potential in the past. So uh, big kid throws hard, not super efforty controlled mover starting to show more off speed feel. That's a guy the pro guys are going to see throughout the spring um, for sure. Uh, and then kind of just wrapping it up here with two more future gamers in Connor blue and Andrew Winslow uh, Connor blue O'Fallon's number one arm uh, Cincinnati commit was a guy that came to the future games for us and and, and, and really turned some heads with his polish and, and, and spin feel. Uh, strong kid, good mover, touched 91 twice in the first inning, basically pitched at 88-90 over three innings against Brother Rice for O'Fallon, gave up one run, punched out a few. Uh, but the separator for him that, that really kind of makes him different is is the breaking ball. You'll see it in, in the video, man. It is a sharp swing and miss pitch for my money it's as good as any breaking ball in the entire state uh he'll throw it anywhere from the mid to upper 70s confident in it again we'll throw it 2-0 3-1 uh in 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 fastball counts he's flipping over that breaking ball for strikes and for swing and miss um and honestly i've seen him throw a change up to left-handed bats too in the low 80s with fade and feel for it so starter profile for connor blue uh and then drew winslow talk about unique um, six foot six, 195 pounds, long, lanky limbs. Um, he's a basketball player for triad average 14.6 points per game, 5.4 rebounds per game for the Knights this past winter on the basketball court. Um, another future gamer. He was up to our Oklahoma state commit to, he was up to 91 in the first inning with <coughs> me coming off basketball season is pretty noticeable. Um, at this time last year, I saw him and he was up to 89. So taking a two mile an hour jump, but Honestly, probably more impressive is the fact that he basically held 88 to 90 with his fastball, touching 90 in the fourth inning, his last inning. I think it was pitch number 69 of the game. He was up to 90. Uh, at this point last year, four innings deep, he would have been more in the 84 to 85 range. So not only taking a max 
or a, a, a jump in, in, in max velo, but holding that velocity too for a kid that's 6'6", 195, he's very far away from what he's going to end up being physically. Um, separator for him that makes him unique is he, he throws one from kind of a three-quarter slot. So you have a tall, lanky kid throwing from his hip coming at you, gets all sorts of arm side run on that fastball. Uh, he's throwing a sinker now in 80, at 86 to 88 miles an hour. It's a real lane changer. Like it's going to help him stay off barrels against left-handed bats and kind of barrel into righties too. And the slider, 75 to 78 miles an hour, comes out of the same exact window as his fastball. Uh, really, really good pitch, man. Kind of that true sweeper, hard sweep, covers the whole plate. Got some pretty uncomfortable swings on it. Guys have a hard time picking it up because the way it comes out, it just falls off the cliff. So that's a guy that ha has been one of the better arms down here for a while. He will continue to be, and he he's so far away from what his future self on the mound is going to look like um, and is another name that will, will garner draft attention at this time next year. So those are kind of some of the top guys I am sure I'm missing on some arms. We saw so many good stuff down here, and, and, and there's always arms in Southern Illinois that you'll run into a guy every single game you go to. But some standout names for sure at the kickoff classic. Yeah, a lot of high-end guys uh, and, and a lot of looks that we got to see at the kickoff classic. And another guy uh, that we forgot to mention, uh, Alabama commit Joe Chiroto, who a two-way guy, a two-time state championship <clears throat> Uh, champion winner for Edwardsville uh, had a tough matchup in that opening uh, first game for him on the bump, taking on brother rice in a game, a rematch of the state championship from last year, Peter Hammett able to go see him uh, in a game where again, don't let size deceive you uh, because he comes out and, and is electric out there. Yeah. I mean, I can't remember the last time I was that fired up for a, a game like the, state title rematch with Shiroto on the bump versus Gimzik, Brother Rice's ace. I mean, if that doesn't get you fired up, then I don't know what will. Um, but yeah, I mean, Shiroto, he is, I mean, as Shooter Hunt would say, undersized is the new 6'4", but I mean, he gives me some like Owen Murphy vibes in a way. Like, he's obviously not the 6'6", Drew Winslow, but he's very strong. And the way he gets down the mound, he is very in his legs, and he gets a low release height on his fat well, on all his pitches, but his fastball primarily. And from there, it carries up in the top of the zone, and it'll hold plane at the bottom. So he, and I mean, he was, again, Diego said there's a difference between command and control. I would say he was commanding the fastball up and down. Like, it was um, advanced feel for it. And then he was going to a slider uh, most often to get the swing and miss. And he was super confident in that, super late action, um, two plane breaks, strikes, put guys away, whatever he wanted. And then he would flash a curveball. Um, he was getting on uh, behind it a little bit. It was kind of popping out early, um, but he didn't need it. You know, he went fastball slider mainly. And then he would go, he flashed a changeup. Um, in his warmups, and it was one of the best changeups I'd ever seen from a high schooler. He just doesn't throw it in game, I guess. Um, but man, if he gets that thing going too in game, I don't see how anyone's going to touch him. But yeah, I mean, just ultra competitive, not scared. You know, Brother Rice, one of the top teams in the state, just went right after him. 3.2 innings, one hit, punched out five. And, and then the, the inning after he came out of the game from pitching, he went over to center field and Diego was watching it with me. He, from his back foot, throws a guy out at third base, just like no problem. So he's a really fun one for me. Um, and just the way he's able to repeat his delivery, um, the athleticism, the balance he has, like that dude's going to throw strikes. He's going to, he's going to keep throwing harder. Uh, there's just a lot of arrows pointed up for Schroeder for me. He is an absolute freak in every sense of the word. <laughs> Uh, 5'11", 180 is what we have in list to that. He's a 6'6", 8 runner, 98 from the outfield at one of our events with a 101 exit velo. Uh, the play he made in center field was absolutely ridiculous. And also, like, the fact that I'm pretty sure, Drew, you saw him hit a homer later in the game, uh, later in the weekend. He hits in the two-hole or towards the top of their lineup when he's not playing or when he's not pitching and starting in center field. He's one of the best bats in Edwardsville. 
uh, and a two-time state champ that has pitched in several key games uh, for them already in his high school career before even being an upperclassman. Uh, pitched in a huge game in the playoffs last year in the super sectional. Uh, started the game against York in the state semis um, and dominated. Like, there are few, if any, arms in the state. If I have to win a baseball game that I would rather give the ball to than Joe Toroto and what he's accomplished already on a program that is storied, obviously, with a, with a pretty rich history behind it, is extremely impressive. So Yeah, and I did – I did get a chance to see Chiroto, um as a position player uh, on Friday night, Saturday morning. Um, was was quiet on Friday night against JCA. They've got a couple talented left-handed arms. Um, but on Saturday, New Trier had to go to the bullpen, and very first pitch out of the bullpen, Joe Chiroto takes it what seemed like 450 feet to dead center, no doubt. Really impressive swing. Um, I think we've said enough about Chiroto, but he is a explosive, dynamic, two-way athlete that the talent on the mound may make him put the bat down at some point. Um, but for right now, it's still it's an impressive athlete and an impressive position player and two-way prospect for Edwardsville and certainly leads the way for them down there. Um, but, Joe, one other arm that I just want to talk um, touch on here, talking about Central Illinois, Southern Illinois arms, there is another – Really talented arm coming out of Glenwood, um, a place that has, you know, produced the Matons. They produced the Detmers. Um, the next in line looks to be Cameron Appenzeller. Um, we had seen him early last summer. He kind of emerged in Rantoul at a, one of our PBRT events, and um, we were following him ever since. He was on the shortlist for the future games, and right before the future games, he rolls his ankle. So we weren't able to get one last look at him. He wasn't going to be 100% for the future games. Um, but talent-wise, he certainly deserved to be there. We got to look at him later in the fall while he was in the middle of golf season at the Battle for the Arch. Highly, highly projectable. He's he's listed at 6'5", um, probably 6'4", 6'5", long levers, loose, easy. He was mid, mid to upper, flashing upper in the fall, and then um, – when I got my eyes on him down there at the kickoff classic, first pitch out of the game was 90. Basically held and sat 87, 89 from that point forward. Would, was mixing in an above average breaking ball. Calling it a curveball. I, it, it's got more sweeperish action to me. Um, a big breaker, though, um, with, with above average feel for his age right now, I would say, and definitely above average action. Throwing it in the upper 70s. Um, you know, flash to change up to it's starter profile. It is all ceiling. Um, it is a good mover. You know, he's really, really interesting as it is right now. Um, but the ceiling to me is what gets, gets me so excited and really what to watch for him because the sky's the limit. Um, the velo should only increase as he adds, you know, as he adds strength to his frame. Right now, it's just hard for him. He's a three-sport athlete. He plays golf in the fall. He plays basketball in the winter, and then he hops right out there and plays baseball in the spring. Um, he didn't give up a hit. He was facing a, a really good JCA team. Um, did not give up a hit. And then the moment he comes out of the game, JCA looked like a different lineup. So I think it speaks to his stuff. And uh, he is one that should be really exciting to uh, to follow moving forward. A key piece for that Glenwood team who actually got a win uh, in the kickoff classic against our number four team in the Power 25, Brother Rice. And a lot of good games, a lot of really good matchups that we saw uh, in this opening look. JCA, as you mentioned, it got off to a hot start and they got a lot of guys on that squad. But Drew, looking through kind of the lineup of these games, got to see a lot of different teams from all over the state as well uh, as a lot of teams from different classes. What were your biggest surprises of the weekend? Well, you're touching on something right there that um, I love, and I just kind of want to bring a little more light to it, but the kickoff classic, it's uh, something that started about five years ago. Tim Funkhauser, uh, Joe Bauer, Tim Funkhauser's at Edwardsville, Joe Bauer's at O'Fallon. They really helped spearhead this thing. They put the roster to, or the, the schedule together, the roster of the teams. And, um, what it does is it matches up a lot of Northern Illinois, Chicago teams against Southern Illinois, Central Illinois teams that typically would not play each other, that we would not see matchups unless it's deep in the playoffs, uh, something like that. So for us as a staff, I mean, this is 
this is heaven for us because we get to knock off so many teams throughout the state all in one weekend. We bring, you know, four to five of our staff down there to cover games, sit at different sites, run around, see who, you know, try to see as many good arms as, and good teams as possible. Um, but with that said, there were a lot of good matchups and there were some teams that kind of solidified themselves as, as some of the top teams in the state to, to start the year. Um you know, you mentioned the Glenwood defeating Brother Rice. I think that's a a, a big win for Glenwood. Um, they lost to JCA the the day I saw them, um, but a good bounce back win for them. And they had a, a guy named Dylan Huff throwing there. And Diego, I don't know if you saw that game. If you want to touch on anything there, yeah, I was. I did not. Um, yeah, Gavin Smith, our Central Illinois Air Scout, saw that game. But Dylan Huff, we did see him in the winter. Um, another tall three sport kid, football, basketball, baseball, six three, one eighty. Um honestly looks the part of the next big Glenwood arm following Appenzeller. Uh he was eighty three, eighty five that day, kinda inconsistent field for the breaking ball, but coming right off the basketball season, he came to our southern our southern Illinois preseason ID uh at the new sports barn in in Wood River uh this this winter and was extremely interesting. The way it comes out, the body, the fact that, you know, we, we kind of had that background knowledge of him being a, a three sport guy that he's in the middle of basketball season. And one of those guys, man, that once they stop playing basketball and baseball or, uh, and, and football and they're in college, like those dudes tend to take a pretty big jump. Um, so another follow arm there for Glenwood that was really good for them. They, they were no hitting brother rice going into the seventh inning in that game up seven, nothing. I think I ended up winning eight to two. So, so they're going to, I mean, they, they're going to have a top two there with, with Appenzeller and Huff to, to compete um, in that conference there in central, central Illinois. Um, talking about some other teams though, JCA, I think they probably deserve um, the biggest kudos, the biggest uh, maybe love coming out of the kickoff classic. They're four and oh, they went three and oh down at the kickoff classic. They started their year off taking down Manuka. Uh, we were actually at that game. Um, I personally was not. Peter was there with Tyler. Um, and they, you know, I want to make sure that I check all of our all of our stats here and make sure I get it right and I don't uh, don't mistake anything. But when I saw them, they were losing to Glenwood to start the game. Glenwood has to go to the pen. JCA jumps all over them. And, I mean, it really wasn't a game after Appenzeller was out. Uh, they ended up knocking off Glenwood 9-3. to three. Then they come right back after that game, and they have to face our preseason number one, Edwardsville. And they line up Jacob Gimble and Lucas Grant, the same two guys that they threw to start the year against Manuka. Um, pretty pretty darn good little one-two punch they've got there to, to pitch in games. Uh, Jacob, Jacob Gimble's going to Heartland. He's a senior. And what I saw out of him was highly impressive. It was a mid eighties fastball, uh, gets a ton of ride. And like, it's, it's got some sneaky life to it. I don't know if he hides it really good or something, but he was beating bats up in the zone. He was able to throw his breaking ball for a strike whenever he wanted in any count, he was manipulating it. He was showing a change up ultra competitive, fast worker on the mound. Like just, I liked everything about it. He's going to give JC a chance to win every time he takes the ball. Um, and then, you know, he goes three innings. Who do they bring out of the pen? An uncommitted lefty, Lucas Grant, who was equally as impressive. Uh, different. He's got a different style uh, to, to the, the, way he, the way he pitches. Um, he more sinks it and runs it and tries to pitch at the bottom of the zone. Almost all of his misses were down. Um, he very rarely was up in the zone. And then he was playing like a, a firm, short, horizontal slider off of his fastball. Um, but he's an uncommitted arm that popped really this winter. We saw it at the All State, um, where he was one of the better movers on the day, filled up the strike zone with strikes, was up to 90, I want to say that day. And when I saw him, I'm just checking my notes here um, on Lucas. <clears throat> he was throwing his uh he was throwing his fastball, basically sitting 87, 88, but he was touching some nines and touched and touched 90 one time. He throws his slider at 77, 78. Um and dominated. He dominated. Uh, him and Gimble, both. I mean, they cruised. They were in total control of the game. It was highly impressive. Given the arms that JCA has, they are going to be a, a team to be reckoned with. Because um, a name we haven't even mentioned is Aiden Hayes. Um, Aiden Hazy. Forgive me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. 
Um, but you know, he started against Glenwood only through two innings, flashed high level stuff. Um, it wasn't con- inconsistent. You know, the control was hit or miss. Um, uh, but he's got, you know, a fastball up to 93. That's what I saw that day, basically sitting 91, 92. Um, and then offensively, they are just a bunch of solid baseball players that grind, that take quality at bats, that play defense, that run the bases. They've got um, a catcher in Zach Pomato that handles the staff. He's kind of the field general. He's a tough nose, hard nosed guy. He's willing to block everything, hits left handed. Um, they are just a tough, tough group. And if they're going to get that kind of pitching, they are going to be tough to beat. And I would let anybody else <clears throat> speak on them that saw them. Uh, that was my take. And, you know, they're always well coached with Jared Voss. He's one of the best in the state. Uh, the track record speaks for itself. They've got a good staff. They've got Ryan Quigley on staff handling the pitchers. Uh, so they are just, that's a good program. It is a good program. And they've got, they've got a squad this year. So, yeah. They yeah. turned around and, uh, Faced off with with Triad on Saturday, another you know Triad's three A, JCA's three A, three A now, uh, and they got Drew Winslow. Uh, they got to him a little bit. They scored two runs on him. One of them was a homer down the right field line by Zach Beitler, who had a, a pretty big RBI double, a uh, two run double down the left field line. But I I honestly saw a lot of what you're saying, Drew. Like they are scrappy. Uh, Lucas Simulik, a sophomore for them, two times he came up to bat with a guy on third base and less than two outs. Both times, ground ball to the right side to put to 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 bring that run home. Uh, plays a really, really, really good sh- uh, shortstop defensively. Um, so you kind of saw like their power arms. Uh, they brought three guys in when I saw them, all strike throwers. Rocco Zambalan uh, making his first varsity start, uh, a sophomore. Was up to 85, uh, pitching in the low 80s. A little inconsistent, but around the zone when he needed to be executing. They brought they brought in Owen Weirs out of the bullpen, a senior, low 80s strike thrower, um, and they didn't beat themselves. They made the plays when they needed to. Two times in that game, they got a double play to end the inning uh, in a key spot. You know, Triad not an easy out, never will be. They're well coached. They have a talented roster. Every time JCA threw a punch, Triad punched them back. It was a close game, eight seven, but. They found a way to get out of it. They found a way to win, and that's what good teams do. So, And, Peter, I don't know if you were going to uh, speak up here. I I failed to mention, you know, I was talking about their power arms. Uh, in the game against Glenwood, they went to the pen, and they brought in Frank Kerbis. He's a senior going to St. Francis, and he completely changed the entire um, – dynamic of that game changed the momentum he came in and threw nothing but strikes it was not you know overly uh overly power powerful with the fastball he was 81 82 but he threw his breaking ball four strike any time that he wanted to from 72 to 76 and it was impressive and i mean we're talking about all these arms that they have at their disposal um i'm not sure there's only a handful of schools across the state that have a collection of arms like this but yeah pete if you have anything else you want to color in feel free yeah, no, I saw a lot of the same stuff against Manuka. I saw Gimbal and Grant, and it was a lot of the same, both dominant. Um, but, yeah, the thing that stood out the most to me was probably their lineup. Um, obviously, those are two great arms, um, but they might not have the most, like, flashy names throughout the lineup. You know, they're not all D1 commits like yep. some other schools. But they do got some power. You know, they got Jake Schroiner, um, D1 commit. But they're all just, like you said, really good, hard-nosed kids that are just not kids you want to face. They're not – me being a pitcher, those are the, like – those kids give you problems. They fight you and wear you out. And, like, everything else they do, they run the bases well. They defend well. It's just, it's just an all-around solid group, and I think we can expect to see a lot of the same stuff moving forward from them, especially with their younger class too. Like their younger class with Simulik being a 26. Um, and then Ian Campbell Rocco. came out. Yeah. Ian Campbell. We didn't even see him at the kickoff class. Like, I don't know if they'll need him and he's a sophomore. We saw up to 90 this winter um, yeah. and just a really dynamic, powerful kid um, mm-hmm. among others. Yeah. Isaac Harris is another one left-handed arm down there in that class. So yeah, that's a great point. You know, we talked about some of the top teams in, in the three, a, that we've seen uh, a lot of depth with those arms. And uh, Nazareth, another team that we haven't seen too much yet, uh, but off to a quick start, 7-0 and on the year, coming off 
that second straight state championship last year. It's really led by that 2024 class. They've been big, and you know they're going to have a lot of good games that we'll be able to see here this spring. Normal community, we mentioned earlier, uh, obviously Brady Banks in our pitcher of the week in week one uh, for Illinois. But, Peter, we've seen a lot of depth from this team. And obviously, off to a quick start, 5-0. and uh, The arms don't end with Bankston, as they got a lot a lot of guys to go for uh, out of the pen. Yeah, I mean, obviously, they got Ethan Eberle, who's their horse. You know, lefty going to Louisville. He's, um, man, I don't even know the exact numbers he put up last year, but they were video game, road to the show type numbers. Um, like, maybe gave up, like, one run all year or something like that. Uh, he normally would pitch in the upper 80s, which is like a foot and a half a run, really good breaking ball. And then we saw him at our pro case, and he was bumping 91, 92. So, yeah, they got him at their disposal, obviously. And then they really haven't even needed him this year. They got um, Bankston, like I saw. Then the first game I saw against uh, Moline, they won 11-1. They started Jake Branch, who's a solid uh, low 80s righty. Uh, Fills up the zone with three pitches. He's a solid arm they got. Then they went to Caleb Hackman, who's one of their main bats, Augustana Commit Sr. Uh, he ran it up to 89. He filled it up for an inning or two, and then they went to Jonah Roper after Bankston in the second game, and he was 85 to 88, pulling the string on a changeup whenever he wanted, and they couldn't touch him. So they just And I know they got more arms than that, but, yeah, I mean, they are going to be tough to beat on the mound, and then even their offense, like Caleb Hackman, like I said, and then they had Ryan Thiel. Um, he's been tearing it up so far this spring. He had a couple knocks in, on the day when I saw him, but, yeah, they're, they're top of the order is scrappy. They can put some runs on the board, and then if they got that pitching staff as deep as it is, it's going to be hard for other teams to push runs across on them. And for a few of the other teams that we saw, uh, in the kickoff classic, obviously some of you know some teams that we saw uh, in June in the state championship, Edwardsville and Brother Rice uh, again faced off in that 4A state championship. We saw, as we mentioned before, uh, Diego. It's been a tough start for them. Obviously, super well coached uh, with those two programs, and again, they they don't uh, aren't afraid to really schedule against any team in the state of Illinois. Uh, but for them, obviously, they squared off. Uh, early on in the year. Those are two programs to watch um, despite the slow start for them. The one quick nugget I'll, I'll drop here on, on Edwardsville is is kind of what you mentioned. Like they, they are not scared to to play anybody. Uh, they, they schedule themselves to play against Joya Catholic, Brother Rice, and, and, and New Trier, all teams that are in the top six of our Power 25. Coach Von Kauser will play anybody at any point in time. Year over year, their schedule is is really tough. They they double dip and go into Missouri too. They played the Smet, which is a program that has perennially had success in Missouri. They'll play Francis Howell, which is basically the Edwardsville of Missouri. Um, they'll play Jackson, which is another big time program in Missouri. CBC too. So you'll you'll find them, you know, with nine, ten losses when the playoffs come around, and it's by design. It's to battle test their group. Um, this year's team, like they graduated the first five guys in their lineup, their entire infield graduates, essentially Cole Funkhauser, Caden Jennings, Riley Afrig, Andrew Hendrickson, Caleb Copeland was one of their big time bats out in right field for them. Um, and, uh, some arms too. So it's a new group. It is like some of those guys were on their, bar, uh, are on their state champion team last year, but weren't necessarily relied upon to be big time contributors other than Joe Chiroto. Um, so they're probably going to take their lumps, but you can be certain that by the time May rolls around that a Tim Funkhauser led Edwardsville team will be ready to play anybody on any given day in the playoffs. Yeah, I think you kind of said that perfect, Diego. Um, he gets it. He knows what, when the most important time of the year is, uh, and it's not mid-March. Um, and he's going to give his arms a chance to succeed, a chance to fail, and he's going to do the same with the lineup. And, you know, he's lucky down there. Like, it's it's a beautiful high school, and they've created a culture where, where kids want to come there and, and play baseball at that school. And he has depth. Um, he has the luxury to, to try, you know, different lineups and um, – to let guys fail and give guys chances. But uh, like, like you said, they, they will be a tough out every year come May. 
Um, and he is not scared. The schedule he put together down there at the kickoff classic was it made for some great matchups. We got to learn a ton about Edwardsville. They're really good on the mound. Really good. They are going to have to figure it out offensively. And, um, they have a couple pieces that I, I don't really see moving like Lucas Krebs at shortstop. He, he's going to probably get it done there. Hunter ball at second base. He's a sophomore and he's kind of the next really good player to come out of Edwardsville. Uh, currently he does everything well. He's just a little undersized, uh, just needs to get stronger, but he's a two way guy for him. And I love it on the mound. He came out in a, uh, so they played brother rice, um, when Pete saw him and that game got delayed due to lightning and hail that Pete's car got some damage on. Um, so it was kind of nasty there that first night that they were watching, but they, they resumed the game. Um, I guess it was the night after and they put Hunter ball out there on the mound, sixth inning Edwardsville up one, <coughs> up one, nothing. And, uh, I mean, Hunter Ball looked like a college guy out there going going about his business. Could not have been more calm, confident. His mannerisms, throwing a breaking ball for a strike whenever he wanted to, sitting in the mid '80s, and did not get help from his defense. Um, and you know, could have gotten really tight there, but acted completely unfazed. And I, I'm a big fan of him. And they've got they've got a lot of players. Um, they will they will figure it out and. Who knows what their record will be come playoff time, but they will be tough. Um, and you mentioned Nazareth. They were not down at the kickoff classic, but they got off to a 7-0 and start. We have not seen them. Uh, we will have plenty of opportunities to see them play in the, in, playing in the East Suburban Catholic. Um, there's good matchups there all the time. We'll be able to get out and, and kind of see what they're working with. But um, they are they are a team to watch. Um, they bring back a lot, and they will be tough. Um and they're they're going for there's three schools right now in the state of Illinois that are going for their third straight state champion. And something has to give because JCA was doing it in two A and now they're up to three A, the same the same classification as uh Nazareth and, and Edwardsville's trying to go for it in four A. Um so I'm trying to think the you know, one other team, Joe, that I think deserves just a little mention uh out of the gate. Because some teams have played a lot of games, some teams haven't. Is Downers Grove North? Uh, they're four and zero. They were not at the kickoff classic. Um, they have not gotten into conference play yet, so we will see. You know how that goes, but they were an offense we were excited about to start the year. And just looking through their their stat line, they've won eleven nothing, twelve to two, eleven to ten, and three to one. So the offense seems to be there. Um, we'll see if they get enough pitching, but, um, a lot of, a lot of depth on that, um, lineup as well. And a few other teams that we were able to see, uh, and super high on in the power 25, uh, that also are, are trying to pick things up as we head to the middle of the year are O'Fallon Stevenson and Bradley Bourbon, uh, three teams, uh, that have a lot of depth and a lot of really high end prospects, uh, that should be interesting. Uh, as we head down to the really the beginning uh, of the hot start of the year. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on O'Fallon quick. Um, they are another program that year over year down here is always good. Um, they have a great setup at Blazier Field. They have, they're really well coached. Joe Bauer, Scott Sype, all their assistants do a great job. Fundamentally, they're, they're kind of a team that normally doesn't beat themselves, Um Early on this year, like against Brother Rice, against Joliet West, uh, they kind of cost themselves the game. They're a young team. They are. They, they do have a handful of seniors at key spots last year. They graduated seniors. Um, their center fielder, Hayden McGill, their catcher, Will Millard, uh, their shortstop, Xavier Deathridge, all gone now. Um, so positionally, they're a young group. Their 2026 class, their sophomores are super talented, but they are young. Uh, behind the plate, they have a sophomore and a freshman uh, catching. So they're going to take their lumps um, and they're going to be battle tested again, just like Funkhauser. Joe Bauer's not scared. They'll play anybody. They just went down to Kentucky and played McCracken County, who's always pretty good. Uh, they played Kennett, who in Missouri is our number three small school uh, team on our ranking. So, and obviously the, the Southwestern Conference itself is a gauntlet. Um, but you want to talk about arms, like O'Fallon is, is, a, is one of those teams that doesn't lack any. Um, we touched on Connor Blue earlier. He's about as good of a frontline guy as you'll find at uh, here in the St. Louis area. David and Michael Barker, two twins, going to Arkansas State. 
They're twins, but on the mound, they're pretty different. Uh, David is kind of a three-quarter guy, throws from his hip. I couldn't love how it comes out anymore. It's like a true sinker with hard arm side run. So I'm up to 91, uh, pitching at 88, 90 with a slider that goes the opposite direction. Didn't have his best stuff, didn't have his best uh, feel for the zone when I saw him against Brother Rice, but he was really good for them last year in the strike zone often, had like a 1-2 ERA and 50 innings of work. Um, and his brother, Michael, who's taken a significant jump in the last 12 months, uh, throws for more up here. He was up to 90 against Juliet West, will spin kind of a true 11-5 breaking ball in the strike zone. Um you got Connor Blue, you got Jack Bellino, Alex Tame, Evan Day, three seniors that are all strike throwers in the low 80s, can land breaking ball for strikes. And then there's sophomore class, which I think will be kind of what defines the direction of this group. Uh, Dylan Jantz, big physical kid, 6'5", every bit of it, uh, could easily throw on 20 to 30 pounds of muscle over the next two years, 84, 86. Saw him come out of the pen in a big spot against Juliet West and get out of it. He'll spin a breaking ball for strikes, throws a real splitter. that has got some swing and miss potential. Anthony Perez, left-handed pitcher, 84-86, young look, um, also swings the bat for them. Came up huge against Juliet West with a pinch hit, two-run single the other way. Um, Sam McCollum, 84-86, strike thrower, will play the outfield for them. Uh, th they have a ton of arms. There's guys that I'm missing. Yeah, it just doesn't um, I, stop. Yeah. Actually, when I when I went to go watch them play Gillespie on opening day, their JV team was playing, and all their sophomores were playing or were throwing over there. So I wandered over to their JV field to watch it for a little bit, and was just thinking, I I, I can't imagine there's that many programs in the state rolling out three mid to upper eighties sophomores on a JV field. Um, and that's what they have. It doesn't end like on any given day. They're going to have a good arm on the mound, and in in the playoffs, that's what wins. Um, so if, if they can figure it out positionally and they can kind of hone it in and and season themselves is probably the right word to use. Like that's a team that no one's going to want to play in late May and early June. There uh, there's some varsity squads out there that would take that JV pitching staff. <laughs> it sounds like, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Stevenson's two and three. Uh, they were our preseason number 12 team. Uh, Bradley Bourbon, a, they were our number 22 team. They're two and four. Um, it's early, but yeah, we're not sure. You know, we, I did not see Stevenson yet. Um, and it kind of, it leads me to at least discuss what we were thinking with the power 25. Um, cause we were all ready to update the rankings this, this week. We, you know, our, our whole staff comes through and combs through all the records and, um, all the teams and who they beat, who they lost to, um, and we were looking at our spreadsheet today and it's just, it's hard. It's, it's, you know, Nazareth has played seven games. There's seven and oh, and a team like Lake park, who is our preseason number 18, they haven't played a game yet. They're opening up on their spring trip, which they're taking right now. Um, and a team that we'll talk about, you know, down here as a team to watch, like Highland Park's five and one. They were preseason not ranked. Um, and full disclosure, I, we didn't really have them on our bubble either. Um, but they go in and they knock off. Um, they knock off Hersey, who was our number nine team, five to two. They knock off Stevenson, the number 12 team, nine to three. Both extremely quality wins. Um, they've also beaten Taft 10, nothing. They beat Zion Benton 10, nothing. And they beat a, uh, Aurora, which I want to say it's Aurora, Ohio, um, six to five. And then they also lost to that same Aurora team. So how to, how to stack up a Highland park team who maybe warrants being ahead of Hersey or, or even Stevenson, just with how minimal um, games we've played and how minimal our resume of all these teams are right now, it just makes it really hard. So we, we're we going to try to give it one more week. Um, hopefully the weather shapes up here. I know last week caused a lot of cancellations in northern Illinois because of the cold weather, rain, whatever it may be. Um, a lot of teams are taking spring trips, so they should get a good amount of games under their belt. And I think when we revisit this next week, things will become a little clearer. Um, you know, we'll be able to slot teams with a little bit better confidence, um, and just have a, just a little bit more of an all around feel for these teams. Um, and I think a big thing for us, 
is actually seeing the team. Um, and that's the beauty of the kickoff classic is 46 teams were down there this year. And we try to see every single one of them. I would say out of the 46, we probably saw 40 to 42. Um, Diego could probably call me out on that one way or the other. Um, but it, you know, we were, we were spreading our coverage as best we could. And the eye test plays a role. It absolutely plays a role in our power 25 rankings along with strength of schedule. Um, you know, the roster, how they play the coach, you know, a coach in high school baseball is a big deal. Um, coaches, they know how to basically win games by running the bases, you know, doing first and third plays, bunt defense, bunting teams to death. Like there's, there's, there's a lot of ways to win in high school baseball and a, and a good coach um, goes a long way. So there are a ton of different factors we're looking at and we were already, but we just, we discussed it as a group before this call and we were not ready to, to make an official change to the rankings yet. So we're going to hold off for one more week. Uh, Pete or Diego, do you have anything you want to kind of piggyback off of that with? I'm sure I missed I, something. I, I just want to like reiterating the eye test factor. Um, it's, it's really important to kind of like for us to get out and go see teams, uh, before we really want to make a statement with our rankings, because that stuff does matter. Um, you know, I, I, I love stats. I'm a big numbers guy. I do, but nothing beats the eye test, uh, going out and actually seeing something before kind of putting your stamp of approval on it. Uh, it, it, it means a lot for us, not only for, for team rankings, but for player rankings, for every aspect of what we do, the eye test will trump everything. So that's kind of why we well, we kind of decided to hold off on the power twenty on a formal power twenty five update. Yeah, and for the power twenty five, obviously things will shake up in the next the next few weeks. But we do have a ton of teams kind of in that bubble uh, that we're looking at uh, once those rankings eventually change. And this kind of goes out to each of you guys. What are some of the top teams? Uh, obviously, we talked about Highland Park, two power twenty five teams uh, wins for them, uh, but also some other teams uh, in Southern Illinois as well as the Chicago area that are kind of, you know, slowly getting their way up uh, just outside into the bubble. What are some of the top teams uh, that we should look forward to uh, in the next few weeks before the rankings change? Pete, I would give you the floor here. If there's any teams that, that you see that you want to touch on, I'll, I'll take it from there. There's certainly some teams I can color in, but if there's anybody that, that you've kind of had your eye on, um, whether you've seen them or not, you know, just tracking yeah. the tracking the scores. I know you are a uh, a huge contributor to our daily roundup that we do every day, posting all the scores from around the state. Um, you know, hopefully every everybody out there knows about the daily roundup because we we try to not only put the scores um, from each day and um, put that in one spot for everybody to see, but you're also writing up kind of game recaps. I mean, I don't know if you want to touch on that quick and then, and then get into any teams that you've seen, but um, I know you put a lot of work into that. Yeah, no, the roundup is uh, one of the more unique things that we do as opposed to uh, some other platforms. And I highly uh, suggest everyone, if you don't know what it is, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. I mean, it's yeah. an easy place to see every single score um, from the day before we try and write up as many of the games as we can. And for any coaches that are watching this, if you want to get on there, just send us the scores. We send out an email. Send us a score. It's an easy way to get love. Uh, we want to get everyone in there. Um, so, yeah, unbiased. If you want love, we'll give it to you. Simple as that. Yeah. Um, and then moving forward with uh, some of these yeah. teams to watch. Who do you got on here? Yeah, well, I'm just going to – I haven't seen Lockport yet, but yep. that's kind of a team that I have – seen a lot in the past few years and that is like a a perfect example of like an eye test team where the same with like a Juliet Catholic and Edwardsville like even like a new Trier um very almost like military style warm-up like very organized um no BS everything is very like to a science almost um very well coached like and Lockport I mean big school they're always going to have guys coming through um so yeah that's just a team that i like early um york of course with ryan sloan 
Um, yeah, they were a team we were looking at as a potential power 25. And I know, you know, one dynamic with that, it's a little unique. Uh, Most schools don't have to deal with it, but they do have Ryan Sloan and he's a potential first round pick. And, you know, when you're a a prospect of that caliber, um, there's some there's a lot of ears, uh, a lot of voices that, that have say on on how he's handled in the spring. And I know he'll be on a tight pitch count. So, um that that could factor into just their record early on in the year and how they do. But with that said, even if he's on a tight pitch count, they're three and zero to start the year. And I know he's taking the ball today. Um, depending on the weather, he was going to match up against Lincoln Way Central and Luke Menzik. Um, but sorry to sorry to cut you off. I just no, you're good. That's uh, that's definitely a team that we've been we've been following close because they made a run last year as well to state. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. That goes into that for sure. They made a run to Four I State, which says a lot. You know, highest division. Um, Ryan Sloan leading the charge with that, and he's back. Obviously, it is a little bit difficult with you know what kind of innings restrictions is he going to have? Because um, we don't really know, so you yeah. have to play it safe almost. Um, but they are a very good team. They have experience now in the postseason. Um, they return a good chunk of their guys that were on that team. So they are for sure a team that, you know, they're on the bubble. And if they keep playing well, then they might find themselves in the Power 25. Um, yeah. And then Lane Tech, 6-0. and That was another team that was on the bubble for us. Um, you know, they got two Power 25 wins already. Mount Carmel, 4-3. St. Rita, 8-6. They, they return a good chunk of their guys too, like Ethan Borgren, a a bat going to Northwestern. And then they even got some new faces too. Sebastian Wilson. Yeah. um, One of the more, you know, highly touted. Yeah. Yeah. In the 27 class. Um, And he's already making an impact. He's hitting for them. He's already had a couple homers, I think. Um, So yeah, that's a team that we like as well. And then Montini, um, they're another team. That's almost like, they're almost the same style of team as like a Downers group North for me, where it's a very offensive heavy team. Um, they got a lot of names and bats that we like. It's just, they need to, they need to prove that they can pitch it a little bit too, Yeah, you know, yep. like, but that we are, you know, very in on the offense. They got cash Campbell, um, Drew Church moving around the diamond here. Yeah, they got Quinn Boyer going to yeah, Miami, Quinn of Boyer. Ohio. Um, mm-hmm. I know you've seen them more than I have in the past, so you yeah. can keep rambling. But um, yeah, Dom Catala- Catalano, uh, AJ Manganello, like they got guys all around. So that's a team yeah. we like for sure. They also like they have a new coach. Um, mm-hmm. It's Eric Scott. So yeah, he's um, a good dude. That that sometimes can play a role, good or good or bad. Um, so it's one of those things we got to go see them and, and check it out and see what they got. Yeah. But. I think for me personally, uh, the one team that is not inside our power 25 that really stood out to me early on, I, I've seen them twice is, is Muscuda, a three, a program down here in, in Southern Illinois. Again, another one of those teams that has a track record of basically being good every single year. Don Eddie, their head coach does a great job. Um, you could basically bank on them or triad battling it out in their conference and, and, and fighting for the regional and sectional. Um, we talked about them earlier, but they'll have a chance to win basically every single game. Austin Musso pitches in. He was extremely good for them as a sophomore last year before kind of going down with a little bit of an injury and bouncing back from it. But if, if he's on the mound all year for them, that's a frontline ace that will basically win almost every game he, he pitches in. But other than that, um, it's a super heavy, like upper class heavy group from top to bottom. It's basically all seniors with a couple of juniors sprinkled in. Uh, Gabe Vojak going to McKendry was our Illinois State Games MVP last year. Kind of a guy that last year at this time, I, I didn't really know who he was. Uh, he moved in here from Ohio, shows up, loved every bit of it. He's 5'7", left-handed, plays with his hair on fire, starts in center field for them. Uh just saw him rip a double down the left field line against Belleville East. It was the only run of the game. Stole third, came around to score on a wild pitch in a one nothing ball game. Um, against Mount Vernon in the kickoff classic, he's playing center field. He ranges into the right center field gap, catches the ball over his shoulder, turns around, throws a kid out at third base in a huge spot. Uh, right next to him, 
in left field. Trevor Geis going to Lincoln land. Strong kid, hits in the three-hole for them, kind of provides some of that juice. Big arm from the outfield. Same game, same inning as Vojak. Threw a kid out at home to end the inning uh, to cut down a run. Behind the plate, to me, one of the biggest things in high school baseball uh, to have a successful team, you have to be strong up the middle. But if you have good arms, you got to have someone that can catch them. And Grant Reinick going to Lewis and Clark is one of the better defensive catchers I've seen down here so far. He is an absolute workhorse behind the plate. The kid will throw his body at anything in the dirt, catch and throw, good receive, uh, hits towards the bottom of their lineup. But having him behind the plate is going to be an absolute asset for them. Uh, Wyatt Beer uh, bringing himself back from an injury. He just pitched in a win for them this past weekend against Morris. Um, Strike thrower, low 80s, three pitches. And then around the infield, up the middle for them, Cameronetti, Chase Rotman uh, at short and second, respectively. Two sure-handed guys that are not going to make mistakes. Cameron Mueller, or Camden Mueller, sorry, left-handed bat, starts at third base, hits in the two-hole for them. Um, And then there's a couple youngsters, like Nolan Liebert. He's a sophomore, some up to 84 this past, uh, this winter. Strike thrower will play second base for them on occasion. But the big one for me is Darren Klein. He's a freshman. Um, not a lot of velo right now. I, we saw him up, like kind of bumping it into the low 80s, mostly pitching in, in the upper 70s. It comes out really good. I could not be a bigger fan. If he was throwing 72 miles an hour, I would love every bit of it. Uh, comes into the game. Now, Tyler Defabaugh, one of our other area scouts, saw him really good out of the pen at the kickoff classic. I saw them Wednesday. After Musso, one run game, one nothing against Belleville East. He comes out of the pen, three scoreless innings, throws 28 pitches, 21 of them for uh, for strikes. For a freshman to do that in a tough game, they threatened a little bit. He shut it down right away, landing a breaking ball for strikes. If that kid continues to mature for them with how experienced they are as a group, that's a team that does all the little things right. They take the extra base. You can basically bank on if it's a tight game and a leadoff guy gets on, they're going to bunt him over to second base and find a way to get that runner in. They're well coached. They do all the right things. Muscuta is going to be a team to watch. I think they're going to be a real contender in 3A once the playoffs roll around. Um, so definitely watch them. Joliet West, we briefly touched on some of their guys. Owen Young, um, they've scored 66 runs in seven games. They're averaging nine runs per game right now. The top of that lineup is an absolute gauntlet. Owen Young, James Love going to Eastern Illinois, Jimmy Anderson going to Heartland Community College, Kale Karchewski going to Jeffco in Missouri. Around the infield, they're really good. Um, you know, the top of their lineup's got some juice. James Love coming out of the pen, pitching in the upper 80s for them. Jimmy Anderson started against Rochester, 85-87, spinning the breaking ball for strikes. If they can get consistency on the mound with that lineup, they're going to definitely make some noise on any given day to be able to throw up eight, nine, ten runs in bunches. Um, Monticello, they won 22 games last year. It's a 2A school. They're 10-0 and to start the year, which having already 10 games under their belt is really impressive given how young we are into the season and, and, and the weather. But they got Luke Teschke, man, going to Illinois State, Super 60 participant, uh, about as good of an arm as you'll find. Four pitches, all strikes, 88-92, all state quarterback in the strike zone often. I will venture to guess that they'll win essentially at every game he's on the mound. Colton Vance, Eli Kraft behind the dish. Ike Young is a good little young arm to know there. Looking like a real good 2A squad. Uh, we touched on Rochester earlier when we were talking about Jack Sweeney, 6-0 and to start the year. They won a regional last year in a tough regional. Um, I would expect them, again, Matt Carlson, their their head coach, he does a great job there. Um, and then Effingham, they're 5-0. You want to talk about arms, they always have guys come at, coming out of there. Josh McDevitt's at Mizzou. They had another arm that I'm forgetting about uh, that, Drew, you could probably touch on here in the past. That's been really good. Um, they do a great job every year, well coached. Um, Sacred Heart Griffin is 6-0 and to start the year. St. Joseph Ogden, talk about a team that has a rich history behind them, 2A program. They're 7-1. and And then down here in Glen Carbon, Father McGivney, 7-1. and They were 2A school last year. They went to a super sectional before running into Columbia, who went to back-to-back state titles and had probably one of the best players, if not the best player in the state last year. And Dominic Vagley, uh, who's the Saturday guy at KU now as a freshman. But they are actually 1A this year. 
And that's a 1A program with a 3A, 4A roster. They're really deep. They're super loaded. One through nine, it's a tough out. Drew Kleinheider, Cannon Camp up the middle, Nicholas Franklin behind the plate, Isaac Wendler at first base, Nicholas Terhar playing third base for them is raking so far. They got strike throwers on the mound. Camp will pitch for them. Wendler will pitch for them. Mason Holmes, low 80s, four pitches, all in the strike zone. Riker Keller going to the University of Concordia, Chicago, comes out of the pen, mid-80s guy that could spin a breaking ball for strike. So I would expect the Griffins to be the 1A favorite right now. They're going to play. You know, they, they do schedule themselves against some 2A, 3A competition. Coach Chris Irwin, they do a great job there. So there's a lot of teams to watch down here in, in, in Central and Southern Illinois. They're itching to kind of make their way into the Power 25. That's, uh, that's a good recap there, Diego. It's uh, It truly is really impressive how many arms um, are just down in that area right now and always. And you mentioned Effingham and – uh, big leaguer out of there, Chad Green. Um, they've got a couple arms that have come out of there. Jackson Lee and Zach Lee. Zach went to Kentucky and, and Jackson went to John A. Logan. Um, I actually pulled him up because I didn't want to miss. Um, you mentioned Josh McDevitt. Um, Ben Hecht out of there went to Wichita State. Like they, it's, it's another one of those little small pockets that, uh, just seemingly always has arms coming out of there. So, um, you know, a couple other schools, just since we didn't update the power 25 that are, are making some hay here. Uh, we mentioned Highland park five and one with two power 25 wins. Andrew, um, was a team that somewhat on our radar, we did get a good look at some Andrew guys. Um, this winter at our preseason idea events, a couple guys with some good bats and they're five and oh, uh, with a seven to four win over number 17, Mount Carmel Fenwick, who made a super, se- uh, super sectional last year. They're five and oh to start the year and they return a lot. Um, Lincoln way West, who was basically a mainstay in our top 10 all of last year. They're off to a three and oh start. I think they open up their spring trip at uh, Lake point today. But they're a team to watch. Um, they're going to be out without crafting for a while, but they still they bring back a lot of guys. They got Connor Essenberg leading the way, Lucas Acevedo, and plenty of other names to, to go around. So a lot of good teams to look forward to uh, in the next few weeks as uh, high school baseball is up and running here in Illinois. Um, and we'll keep you updated. Again, follow our socials uh, for Prep Baseball Illinois uh, to keep up to date for articles um, as well as our social media content. Uh, And for Drew Lucasio, Peter Hammett, and Diego Solaris, I'm Joe Sullivan. And that's a wrap for our first ever episode of the IHSA podcast. We'll see you next time.